Good morning. I'm Van Rogerson, President and CEO of the NC East Alliance. We want to thank you for joining us. I um, also want to thank our presenting partners, uh, NCDOT, ECU, EDPNC. I also really want to thank our sponsors who believe in our advocacy program and have joined us as partners. Um, Platinum sponsors, East Carolina, we got Keith Wheeler that has helped us with this presentation, but Dr. Van Scott, um, Bident, Dr. Michael Waldrum, those two um, partners really believe and are strong partners in the 29 county service area that we have that we want to try to make a difference on key issues that are important to the region. Also want to thank Integrated, Integrated Financial Holding, Eric Burgessine and Bull and Company. Aaron um, Bull helps us with our website and social media. You guys, we really appreciate your commitment to the region. Also want to thank the gold sponsors, Beaufort County, got Martin Johnson, Elizabeth Underwood, county leadership that's um, helping us there. And we've got uh, our silver sponsors, uh, Port of Virginia. Um, thank you guys for sponsoring this webinar. Aaron Willett, who's one of the presenters, but Karen and Russ, all you guys, we, we enjoy working with you um, as well as the Port of North Carolina. But um, in this webinar, we're gonna, um, we got you as a presenter, as our sponsor. Nutrien, we thank Ray McKeithen, who's on our board, Martin County. We got Jason Simple, that's a partner of ours and the county officials. So we just really thank all of our supporting partners. We thank you for being here and we really want to work with everybody on the webinar to make a difference in Eastern North Carolina. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Trey Goodson, who's gonna give a few rules of the road for what you should do during this webinar, Trey. Thanks, Van. So we're going to discuss a few of the tools today that we're going to utilize throughout the webinar. To start, if you have any questions throughout the webinar for any of our panelists, please enter them into that Q&A box in the bottom left and submit your question. We will have a question and answer period at the end of the webinar. If you want to ask your question live, you can hit that raise hand icon at the bottom right. We'll unmute you and you can ask your question live. We'll also have the chat box open where you can um, type in your questions as well. Uh, the panelists will also be posting some helpful links or comments in the chat box throughout the webinar. If you plan on asking a question live, you can hit that audio setting tab in the bottom left to make sure your micro microphone settings are correct and that they will work when you wanna ask your question live. If you wanna change the size of the screen at any point during the webinar, you can hit that view options tab at the top and change the size of your screen. You can also click the four arrows in the top right to enter and exit full screen mode when necessary. And I believe that covers everything. So I'd like to introduce our moderator for the day, Dana Magliola from NCDOT Office of Freight and Logistics. Dana, it's all you. Good morning, still morning. Thank you for uh, that introduction, Van and Trey, and thanks for having me today here with NC East. Um, excited to be talking about uh, the industrial supply chain. So I would like to jump in first and let me get to the button here. Trey, you're, you're our button guy, thank you. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists today. We've got Andy Street of Heister Yale. He's the Division Demand and Logistics Manager. Um, and I've known Andy for years, knows a ton about the supply chain and is really a, a seasoned professional. Uh, Thomas Lorenzo from Domtar, uh, an International Transportation Manager, and one of the strongest economic uh, drivers in Eastern North Carolina uh, in, in their sector. So we're looking forward to hearing from Thomas today. We've got Aaron Willette who's with the Port of Virginia. And as we talk about freight assets later today, we know the economic orientation of a lot of Eastern North Carolina is towards Virginia. So we look forward to hearing from him what the landscape and supply chain has looked like. And then Dr. Scott Abney from East Carolina's Department of Tech Systems. Uh, and Dr. Abney is gonna bring, I think maybe a bit of a more of an academic perspective, but also uh, has that background in technology integrated into the supply chain. So without further ado, let's jump in. Um, let's start with Andy. 
All right. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this group today and share a little bit about uh, uh, what High Street Yale has learned from the uh, from the last uh, nine months of um, you know, some pretty challenging times in the uh, global supply chain. Um, head on to the next slide, please. So just a quick overview of, of our organization. Um, you know, our America's division headquarters is based here in Greenville, North Carolina, along with a um, uh, assembly operation for electric um, powered lift trucks. Um, and our business basically is, uh, is operates in kind of three categories. Uh, primarily it's uh, lift truck manufacturing. Um, and we make the full range of, of lift truck products um, and, we, and we produce them globally. Generally, we, we try to produce products in the same market we're, um, we're selling them. So our European factories are, are producing lift trucks for the EMEA region. Um, our North American factories are producing uh, units that are primarily used in the Americas. Um, and then our operations in Asia are primarily distributing product uh, throughout that region. Um, we also have an after um, an attachment business. So basically all the different types of front end attachments that can go on a lift truck. Um, uh, that's a business that uh, we acquired a couple of years ago. And we've been growing it. And then uh, kind of a more exciting um, and, and uh, technological uh, kind of cutting edge uh, part of a business that we bought here uh, a few years ago was uh, fuel cells. So uh, we are starting to produce um, uh, hydrogen fuel cells um, under the Nuvera brand. And um, so that's kind of what we primarily focus on, uh, mainly lift trucks, the attachments that go on lift trucks, and then the power systems um, to, to operate the lift trucks. So um, next slide. I'll go ahead and put everybody at ease. I am not going to read through all these different locations and summarize what they, uh, what they represent, but just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of the global footprint that Heister Yale Group has. Um, these are all um, uh, our locations, uh, joint ventures, affiliate operations, um, assembly operations, engineering, uh, support services. Um, and for those of you that, that, that may not be as familiar with our organization, um, you know, all you see is the, the, the large brown building that sits off the 264 bypass in Greenville. Um, but I just want to put this slide up there so you can see that there's a lot more to our organization. Um, if I was to put our global supply base, um, you know, you, you wouldn't even be able to read this map. Um, it, it would be so populated. So um, uh, just for some perspective. Okay, next slide. Um, so as we kind of look at, uh, at this year and some of the challenges, um, you know, I, I've pulled off a few high level um, actions that the company took. And um, you, you know, first and foremost, um, as, as COVID-19 kind of emerged on the scene and, and started to um, you know, spread and, and uh, we, we started to kind of get a feel for the impact, uh, obviously the, the primary concern for our organization was making sure that we had done everything necessary uh, to, um, to limit the, you know, any exposure for our associates. That goes in our, in our support functions and in, in the offices to um, the folks working out on the shop floors and you know a reevaluation of um, of how we um, how our workstations are spaced out, um, you know any protective barriers that needed to be uh, put in place between the workstations, um, and then obviously anyone that could um, that could work from home, um, you know we we wanted to uh, uh, make that. Uh, that option available. And uh, we still have the majority, vast majority of our um, office-based uh, workforce is working from home. Um, but all of our North American factories, we, um, our, our uh, shop floor associates are, um, are assembling lift trucks on a daily basis. And, and we've done a very good job of, of limiting the exposure within our, within our facilities. So uh, it's been a bit of a success story this year for certain. Um, another uh, kind of key challenge was just, um, you know, how we're managing our, 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 our shipments, you know, inbound, outbound, um, managing our order backlog. Uh, you know, we wanted to find the, the right balance between, um, um, you know, being able to supply products that are needed in the market, 
Um, also trying to pace ourselves to the impact that uh, COVID was having on our operations and our supply base operations, our distributors operations, and our customers operations. So um, that was a uh, quite a challenge, and um, you know a lot of um, a lot of conference calls with our with our supply base, with our um, distribution partners, trying to figure out you know what's what's the right um, uh, response to this situation and um, Learned a lot of valuable lessons through all of that. Um, and then a, a key focus for us at, a, at you know, kind of as an organization wide is how do we, how do we develop and or, you know, adapt our production capabilities so that we can respond quickly to changes in the market? Because uh, we knew this was gonna be a year of, of ups and downs and, and um, not kind of the steady month over month production rates that, that we're um, you know, more used to. All right, next slide, please. So I think um, you know when we look specific at the supply chain um, impact, you know we, they're kind of I broke this down into three phases because when coronavirus initially came on the scene, obviously all everyone's focus was on Asia, um, China in particular. Um, you know there was uh, uh, you know the, the communication and timing were really, um, you know, it was really unique because uh, a lot of this was really exploding during the time of the Chinese New Year celebration. So, you know, a lot of suppliers were, um, were shut down anyway because of um, the, the, there's typically about at least a two to three week period of time in, um, in mid January um, where, uh, you know, where, where they're celebrating the Chinese New Year and, um, and, and a lot of the supply base is, is not operational. They take that as a shutdown every year. Um, so we were, um, it was difficult to get uh, timely information um, to know just um, how impacted your supplier was. Um, but, you know, we, we kept reaching out, um, um, trying to get a clear picture of what was going on. Fortunately, um, part of our kind of normal practice every year is, um, is that we do kind of increase our PO volume ahead of the Chinese New Year so that we um, drive in our, our parts ahead of that uh, two to three week shutdown period. So a lot of times we're, we're getting parts at the uh, end of December, 1st of January, and we're kind of uh, have a bit of a buffer in our inventory uh, to get us through some of the disruption of the Chinese New Year. Um, and that's just something that we've that we've learned over the years and experienced and um, have adapted to and um, and really and we've mitigated the impact of Chinese New Year um, for the most part uh, to our operations. So so a lot of the effort in you know mid January, early February was just all focused on on um, evaluating the impact to our um, Asian supply chain. Um, you know, we moved into phase two pretty quick because um, within a few weeks, um, the spread throughout uh, Europe um, was uh, was rapid. Um, you know, the and I think some of the some of the really unique challenges in Europe that you know almost overnight you had these countries shutting down. Um, it wasn't necessarily a city by city or or state by state. It was complete countries shutting down overnight. You know, access to ports, access to your supply base. Um, you know, the picture changed almost on a daily basis. Um, you know, there was uh, also, you know, the ability to even um, you know, utilize alternative transportation modes was quickly uh, off the table. So, where you may have, uh, you know, standard routings were with ocean containers and um, very reliable, you know, weekly sailing schedules. You know, those sailing schedules were disrupted. So you might would want to look for an air freight option to recover, um, uh, to recover a you know a missed shipment or something along those lines. But you know the the air travel um, was basically um, you know eliminated overnight uh, in and out of Europe as well. So a lot of those um, um, almost every, everywhere you would look for a, a an alternative transportation option, um, you know the the picture was changing on a daily basis, and um, there really wasn't a lot we could do about it. Um, you know, phase three, you know, within a few weeks of, of seeing all this play out in, um, in Europe, uh, you know, obviously we started to see the same thing happen over here. Um, Andy, you know, can I jump in with a, with a quick question before you get to North America? Certainly. 
Um, you know, I think it's interesting the timing of Chinese New Year for sure. Uh, you know, it, it, good and bad timing to that um, compared to to COVID. But did you, what did you see that signaled that transition to the European supply base? Were you guys concerned when you're working with the Asian supply base that Europe was next? Um, it, would what would your ability to kind of predict phase two and where it would land? Well, uh, fortunately for us, we, we have uh, our own manufacturing operations in Northern Italy. Um, we have operations in the UK and the Netherlands. So we have you know, boots on the ground um, throughout uh, uh, Western Europe. And a lot of our initial signals were coming from, um, from our own uh, manufacturing operations. And, and that's how we really knew the, the, the full scope and, and impact of, um, of coronavirus to those countries. And, you know, Italy was one of the countries that was hit, um, you know, really hard, really fast. And, um, and we have a factory that was, you know, relatively close to the epicenter of, of that breakout there. So, um, so that, that definitely helped us in, in Western Europe kind of navigate the, the, the changing landscape. That's interesting. It's interesting to watch the wave. And as you know, as you described them, phases, although that may hit a little close to home for a lot of folks. What phase are we on right now? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Phase like six point something probably. Yes, but, uh, back to you, Andy. Sorry to interrupt. Right, no problem. And, and we, I would say that at this point in time, we've identified, identified about a three to four week uh, delay as things move from one region to the next. And then they generally tend to move east to west. Um, so just kind of throw that out there. But uh, phase three, obviously, uh, this, this spread throughout North America. Now, what complicated this is not only were we trying to dimension the impact to our North American supply base, but we also had to dimension the impact to our own manufacturing operations and, and all the other support operations that we have going on in North America. So, um, so we were looking internally, we were looking externally, and, um, and then really just, you know, th there, there was no countrywide mandate like we saw in some of the European countries. So it was, um, you know, up to each individual state. And in some cases it was up to individual cities and um, so that definitely made it uh, um, a lot of difficulty evaluating the full impact and, and the potential impact. All right, next slide. Um, so I, mean, I think a key for, for any supply chain is, um, is you, know, you have to learn from, uh, uh, from past events. Fortunately for, for us, um, you know, the 2011 uh, earthquake and tsunami in Japan it was quite disruptive to our operations. Um, you know, we we really came out of that um, that experience knowing that we had to um, close the gap and just our our understanding of not just our immediate supply chain partners, um, but you know our tier two, tier three suppliers. Um, you know the the, uh, the the extended logistics network. Um, you know, so, so we've, we've done a lot over the years to dig deep and to understand, um, you know, certain regions of the world where, where we maybe have a concentration of not just tier one suppliers, but tier two and tier three as well. So we know um, if there is an event in this area, um, you know, we, we need to be able to respond very quickly. Um, so I, I'd say that was a, um, uh, a big benefit that came out of 2011. Um, you know, we, we, um, really dug deep into, into the logistics network as well. So which ports are we using, which carriers, how quickly can we shift from one to another? Um, you know, and then some of the risk mitigation things that we put in place, you know, we really evaluated uh, safety stock levels. Um, so, you know, if you're in a high risk area or if, if you're not in a high risk area, but you're in an area where you don't have a lot of alternative options, you know, you really got to look at, um, at safety stocks. You got to look at vendor managed inventories, especially for your overseas supply base, um, so that they're maintaining uh, parts and inventory within North America that you can access. Um, you know, you got to know um, alternative sources. So maybe your primary source is in um, is in is in Asia, but you have a secondary source that's located in North America. And then really understanding your premium transportation options as well. Um, I'd say we also have learned the importance of uh, just communication. Um, you know, internal stakeholders, and you know, our sales team, our, our sales leadership, our marketing teams, our distributors. You know, we had a lot of uh, you know we had weekly, regular communication early on in this because we wanted them to know, uh, you know, the, the actions we were taking. Um, we were keeping our plants running. We were keeping product coming off the production line. 
and uh, you know, and, and we were doing everything possible to um, you know to satisfy the the uh, the needs of, of of our customers, um, and then also just communication externally with our supply base and our logistics partners, keeping them up to date with what we were doing. Um, you know, we scheduled some supplemental down weeks um, uh, throughout the spring. Uh, where we, we would shut our factory down for a week or we'd shut certain production lines down for a week um, to communicating that impact to our um, to our supply chain partners uh, that was that was critical to keep them all up to date with what was going on and then it was planned it wasn't uh, we weren't um, we weren't victims in those situations we were planning that out in advance because it was a, a prudent step to take and then I like the, the, the last point you know if you're familiar with the movie it came out a few years ago called the Martian uh, it's about an astronaut who gets uh, stranded on Mars and has to solve a, uh, a, a laundry list of, of problems to eventually get saved. I hate to ruin the end of the movie for you if you hadn't seen it, but, um, but he's telling a, um, a class of future astronauts at the end of that movie that, uh, you know, when you find yourself in these difficult situations, you got to focus on solving the problem and then moving on to the next problem. And I think that's really a key theme for us in 2020 is, um, um, it, it, you know, when we have problems popping up left and right, you know, challenges, issues, things that maybe we hadn't anticipated or, or we hadn't anticipated the full scope or the full impact. And, um, you know, and really this year was about, uh, about fixing it and then moving on and, and, and allocating our sources to the next problem. And, and, um, and that's really was kind of the theme as we, as we moved through this, um, you know, from Asia to Europe to North America. And, um, and, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, it, it served well for us. And that really was just the mindset of our entire supply chain group was uh, let's do what we got to do, solve the problem. And some of the things, you know, maybe we can't get the full PO out of that supplier. So we've got to, we've got to, you know, cut the PO in half, um, you know, whatever we've got to do to get parts, you know, flowing towards our factory to keep the production lines running. Um, we'd go out and do spot buys with, um, with alternative suppliers. Um, and onboarding new suppliers as well, um, and, you know, and, and then uh, also bringing on board new service providers on the logistics side. So, um, you know, really no option was off the table and, and the mindset from, from our entire group was, you know, do whatever it takes to keep the parts flowing into our factories. Um, Andy, let me ask you a question that kind of popped into my mind early when you start talking about learning from past events. You know, 2011, the earthquake uh, and tsunami was a major disruptor in the supply chain. Was this when resiliency uh, and recovery started to filter into your conversations and your plans, or was this something that has developed over time? Because I think we're seeing a lot of supply chains dust off their resiliency and recovery plans. Sure. I mean, I think that's um, the, the, the 2011 uh, event definitely um, brought that, that resiliency planning like to the forefront and uh, made it kind of a, um, you know, a critical uh, uh, objective of our, of our global supply chain group. So it's not something we just talk about. It's something that, that we do. And, um, and we have a, a very good understanding. And there's been a variety of things that have happened since 2011, you know, port strikes and, um, you know, uh, other weather events around the world, uh, political unrest, um, you know, so that we've had, uh, um, you know, we didn't just learn 2011 and then apply it in, in 2020. We learned it in 2011, and we've actually had, you know, a lot of different experiences to be able to apply those lessons learned over the years. So, um, well, I like to the I like to that you bring it up as a as a cultural approach, a company culture that you know we're we're working to solve these problems and we're planning ahead. And and I like that you described it as we're not the victims here. You know, we're being proactive. Um, I think it's also important to, to harken back to something you pointed out around relationships. You know, you're able to dust off the phone, off those contacts at your suppliers and secondary and, and third level uh, levels of your supply chain. Um, I think that's something to always reinforce is just those relationships. Yes, definitely. Um, okay, I think I've got one more slide. Um, so I just kind of in some concluding thoughts here, um, you know, I think this is important. That I, in, I think coming out of years like this was a temptation to think that if we just had the right supply chain strategy, we could have avoided all this risk. If we just had the right sourcing strategy or logistic strategy. Um, and, and, you know, that's kind of a, um, that's not a, a, a productive or realistic way of thinking. Um, you know, there is no one strategy that's going to mitigate all the risk. And 
I think that, uh, you know, when you look at this year and, and where we are right now, well, the right supply chain strategy is all of them. And, um, you know, if you're going to mitigate risk for your organization and, um, you know, if you, if you weren't sourcing um, out of Asia, um, it, you know, then you didn't have those alternative sources to go to and maybe a North American source um, had to shut down for a month because of coronavirus or, or um, whatever other reason they may have been facing this year. So, you know, you need to be able to um, look at the, the low cost country sourcing from overseas. You need to look at uh, uh, your, your near shore options, um, you know, in Mexico or um, uh, Canada, you know, wherever else in this region of the world. Um, and then obviously domestic sourcing is huge. And, um, and I, I think that, um, you know, domestic sourcing definitely is uh, one of those, um, having a strong domestic uh, supply base is one of the, the, the best uh, hedges against global uncertainty. Um, but, you know, you got to understand where your domestic sources are getting their parts from. So you could very well have a North American source for your parts, but if their suppliers are coming out of Asia uh, or some other region, um, you could still be impacted. So it's important to understand that. Um, you know, there's a, there's a temptation to think that maybe you need to outsource all of your contract logistics needs or you need to manage it all yourself. And more than likely, the, the right answer is some combination of both. Um, you know, vendor managed inventory, definitely something that uh, is an excellent hedge against uncertainty. Um, and then evaluating your safety stock levels or inventory buffer. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, that coming out of 2020, every organization, every supply chain organization needs to be looking um, at, at, at all the options available to them um, when putting their strategy together. Um, you know, and a big thing too for us in an initiative we've had going on for the last few years is just basically figuring out how to replace inventory with information. You know, visibility to your parts and where they are, um, you know, the status of your purchase orders, um, you know, where your supply base is located. Um, you know, we've, we've invested quite a bit and are in the middle of several different projects where we're, you know, improving the way we communicate with our supply base. Um, you know, the data visualization tools that we have available now um, uh, to monitor, you know, high risk areas or high risk, um, uh, you know, shipments or POs. Um, you know, I think that's got to be a, a key takeaway from 2020 is, is uh, just a, a focus on having the right amount of, uh, of information available and, and available in a format that's going to allow you to make quick decisions. And then I asked my last bit of advice would just be don't waste this year. Um, you know, I, I know we're all excited to get uh, to get 2020 behind us and move on to 2021 and uh, hopefully heading towards uh, um, you know, a, a brighter future. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of valuable lessons to be learned and all the headaches and um, and uh, challenges and um, that we've all faced this year. And uh, I really think it would uh, it would be smart of any organization to uh, kind of sit down once the dust has settled and really evaluate what worked and what didn't work um, this past year and then uh, figure out what you need to implement to uh, to um, you know to mitigate some of those risks going forward. Because um, I hate to say it, but uh, I don't want to end the bad note here, but I think we're all uh, wise enough and experienced enough to know that uh, it, it may not be coronavirus, um, but there will definitely be some other event in the in the near future that is going to be disruptive and, and will need to be managed um, you know, effectively by our organizations. So um, that kind of concludes my comments. Andy, thank you. I mean, I think you hit some really important things here and you know, things that we hear regularly in the conversation between nearshoring, domestic sourcing, um, do you see areas uh, like we've we've often heard the winners in this are going to be Southeast Asia and Mexico as you look at uh, moving towards low cost environments and near shore sourcing? Is that something you see in your supply chain as well? Uh, you know, we we uh, we manufacture globally and we source globally. So for us, you know, there's a um, you know we're looking for suppliers that have the expertise in the product that we're needing to get. So if that, if that supply base is in Asia, then that's where we'll go to source the product. If that supply base is, is in Mexico, then that's where we'll go. If they're in Western Europe and North America, 
Um, so that's really what we look for first. And, um, and then, you know, okay, well, where would our backups be? Where do we want to have an alternative source and where does it make the most sense? Um, and, and we really, our, our supply chain organization is actually a global organization. So, um, you know, there's no real distinguishing between um, our America's operations and our European operations. Yeah. Supply there's a, there's lots there. of near shores. Yes, that's right. <laughs> there's that's lots right. of near shores. Well, Andy, thanks for that great presentation. Um, we'll have some time to talk a little bit more um, with you later, but I'd like to switch over. And we've heard some great expertise and really some practitioner uh, view from Andy. And I didn't give Thomas Lorenzo, our next speaker, the best introduction. And looking at some of his uh, his. CV, you're talking about a, a gentleman with 20 plus years in, in the transportation logistics space, an ocean logistics subject matter expert, and there's really not much in the supply chain from procurement to contract negotiations that he hasn't done. So uh, Thomas, apologies for the, for the weak introduction, but we look forward to hearing from you on how Domtar's industrial supply chain is faring. Hey, can you hear me, Dana? Yes, you're you're all good. We can't okay, see you great. yet. Okay. You're good. Let's let's change that real quick here. And your slides are up and good to go. Okay. Can you see me now? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> so uh, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, uh, I really appreciate that, and thanks for having me today. Um, a uh, great opportunity to talk a little bit about Domtar Paper and about our uh, presence in, uh, in Washington County, North Carolina at our Plymouth Mill. So uh, just to get it off started, uh, some general facts about Domtar Paper. Um, you know, basically, we're a $5.2 billion uh, company. Uh, we are headquartered in Fort Mill, South Carolina. We also have a uh, second headquarters in Montreal, Canada. Um, we operate um, about 13 uh, pulp and paper mills throughout North America, 11 uh, contract manufacturing facilities, uh, and then we also have a personal care division, and so we have manufacturing um, uh, at four uh, facilities worldwide. Um, you know, essentially, um, the company is broken up into a couple of different areas, like we said, pulp and paper manufacturing, uh, personal care. We also have a biomaterials division as well. Uh, so we try to be a pretty diversified uh, forest products based company. Um, basically what keeps the lights on for Domtar paper and uh, our core business is, is essentially communication papers. Um, so basically copy paper, if you think about it that way, as you can imagine, we took a big hit at the beginning of this year with uh, the demand destruction one schools and offices pretty much let out. So uh, it's been a pretty transitional year for us. And uh, as Andy said, we're looking forward to getting it over as well, but uh, lessons learned for sure that will make us better in the future. Uh, so just real quick, uh, a little bit about our Plymouth Mill. Uh, and I apologize, I've only been with Domtar for about five years. Prior to Domtar, I worked for Lowe's Home Improvement. So I kind of managed the imports for, for Lowe's there and and prior to that, I worked with uh, uh, steamship lines and uh, on the vendor side of the business uh, of global logistics. So my um, my knowledge of Domtar and Plymouth Mill is not as great probably as my general overall knowledge of, of, of uh, supply chain and logistics. So I'll, I'll just state that up front. Um, we do basically have uh, Plymouth Mill in um, uh, Washington County, it generates about 390,000 tons of fluff pulp per year. A um, couple of facts about our Plymouth Mill, it's, um, it, it operates at about 90 to 95% export. So um, of what we manufacture, about 95% goes overseas. Um, our next speaker, Aaron at the Port of Virginia, they're one of our best partners in our supply chain. And pretty much all of the containers that we uh, uh, load at the uh, Plymouth, uh, North Carolina facility do go through the Port of Virginia. So we, uh, we tend to be one of the larger shippers uh, in, in, in use uh, and in footprint at the Port of Virginia. Uh, that pretty much puts us at about 250 to 300 containers per week of um, product that we load into containers and that we dray over to 
the Port of Virginia out of our Plymouth mill. Uh, we do have a contract uh, drayage partner, XPO Logistics, who helps us to uh, essentially get that product to the port in the most efficient way possible. Um, you know, the, uh, the fluff pulp that we manufacture at Plymouth is, uh, is generally, it, it's in rolls, and uh, it, it's generally used for consumer goods. So if you think about it, it's kind of, it's very um, sensitive to dirt, and so quality control is a pretty, pretty big issue for us there. Uh, it's used in applications like tissue paper, uh, toilet paper, uh, paper towels, and things of that nature. So um, really, really important that we keep a nice, clean environment at the Plymouth Mill. It's usually a pretty impeccable facility. And, um, you know, really important that we get good containers from the port and from our steamship line partners as well. Um, our destinations uh, where our customers are located for the Plymouth Mill tend to be spread out across the world pretty, pretty well. Uh, we do go to Asia, Europe, and uh, the Middle East. Um, and we have, um, uh, just over the last several years, is we've converted a, um, uh, what used to be a paper manufacturing facility in Ashdown, Arkansas, to fluff pulp as well. And so now Plymouth uh, has a sister mill in Ashdown, Arkansas, which allows us the flexibility to um, you know, source from multiple locations for our customer base. Um, as far as Plymouth uh, uh, Mill is concerned, in, in terms of their initiatives, you know, certainly if we had one of the engineers or one of the um, uh, one of the, the, the local mill uh, facility guys, they can really get into a lot more details. I'm not an engineer, and I'm not. Uh, a manufacturing person per se, but what I will say is that we, we do know that the mill has uh, some uh, multiple initiatives to uh, essentially uh, gear towards uh, getting the most out of their, their, their pulp manufacturing machines. And uh, essentially we have an outlook of growth at the Plymouth mill. So it's moderate growth, but nevertheless, uh, uh, we do anticipate over the next several years to generate uh, more tonnage which hopefully will be good news for us and for the, uh, the Port of Virginia as well. A um, couple of other facts just on the slide that I wanted to call out is uh, we are the largest employer in uh, Washington uh, County, North Carolina. Um, I guess we could tie ourselves to about $718 million of economic impact um, um, for, for the state. Um, and uh, we do generate about 300 plus uh, jobs uh, uh, locally uh, within Washington County and, uh, and, and Plymouth, North Carolina. Um, okay, so I'm ready for the next slide, Trey. Okay, so uh, real quick, I'll just run through this very, very quickly. I pretty much already touched base on a lot of this stuff, but essentially, if you think about the Xerox paper brand, we own the Xerox paper brand. A lot of people don't really are not really familiar with dump tar paper because we don't necessarily brand what we sell. But if you were to go into Staples or Office Depot and purchase reams of paper or boxes of reams, uh, essentially probably about 40% of what you purchase there would be a dump tar product. Um, now, what we don't use in terms so so in order to manufacture paper, you have to manufacture pulp. Pulp is a raw material used in the manufacturing of paper. So what happens is uh, any pulp that we generate and that we do not use in the manufacturing of our paper goods, we then consider market pulp and then we sell to our overseas customers or our domestic customers as well. Okay. And then, like I said, we've got a personal care uh, division, which actually is pretty, pretty interesting fit for us because, you know, we do uh, manufacture uh, baby diapers, uh, adult uh, uh, diapers and things of that nature as well. So, little background on who we are there as a company. Thomas, um, let, me jump, let me jump in and ask you a question just sort of on your, your diverse kind of portfolio here of, of products you guys are producing. Um, when we talk about COVID and some of the supply chain impacts there, um, did you see things get hit at a certain time depending on, you know, where your marketplace is globally? Uh, like we heard from Andy, you know, it, way, it went from a wave from, from Asia to Europe. Was that relevant for you as well? Yeah, it was. Um, I think it's interesting because having multiple different type of product categories um, within forest products, you know, we, we saw some good and some bad. 
so it was a mixed bag for us. I would say that our, our core business definitely experienced a had a, a bad experience, let's call it, through with COVID. Um, you know, with schools and, and, and office buildings out of work, you know, copy paper really took a, a pretty substantial hit, probably about a third of our demand at its peak, you know, of COVID, um, you know, was, was basically disappeared. Um, as a company, we made the decision to say, okay, well, you know, we are a diverse company, but at the same time, you know, you can't deny the fact that uh, communication papers are, are at the, the core of what we do. And so the company decided to just assume that a certain percent of those uh, sales and that demand is probably going to be long-term loss. Okay. So let's go ahead and make some decisions. Let's uh, kind of right size the, the network. And, uh, you know, we did uh, unfortunately have to uh, close a couple of facilities at the same time that we announced uh, some closures though we did go ahead and uh, invest announce an investment of several hundred millions of millions of dollars in a whole new kind of area for domtar which will be recycled liner board so so as as a company without a doubt to your point you know um, paper communication papers demand was was down tremendously we had to take steps to protect the business we then invested uh, in this uh, liner board uh, project, which is going to come to fruition in late 2021 or 2022. And then the pulp business um, actually became kind of a focal point for us. So pulp remained steady to maybe slightly up because of the, uh, the uses of, of wood pulp. So, you know, you have the tissue paper, you have all the things that people hoarded, right, have been hoarding for the last six months are in some way tied to wood pulp as a as a uh, raw material so so we had the good was that uh, we had wood pulp to kind of lean on and uh, our sales to overseas customers actually grew pretty substantially so kind of like your png and your your kimberly clark equivalent in china and other nations so uh so pulp was a good story paper was not a good story um and personal care honestly has been pretty steady. Um, but I think what we're seeing now as the year has progressed is we've seen paper come back. It's not come back entirely, but it's uh, starting to show some signs of return. Uh, pulp has, uh, is going to continue to be an increase area for us. And so I'm not sure, Dana, if that answers your question necessarily. But, I mean, for us, being a diverse company, you know, we were fortunate to have some good to counterbalance the bad that we experienced this year. No, that's great. And it's good perspective. I like that you're, you're able to, you know, make gains where you could in, in ex export markets as well. Uh, I'm personally contributing to your personal care with a newborn at home. So I will try and keep the revenue coming on diapers uh, for the next couple of years that you got me. Um, Thomas, thank you for that. I think it's really interesting to hear that, you know, wood products is still a, a core industry. And I think it's one of those things that Eastern North Carolina has that competitive advantage for when we talk about region. Um, we'll talk a little bit about this with some other folks, but I wanted to, um, to, to throw this in the mix here. You know, you're in a position where you have to move product out. And how do you view the the, the ecosystem of freight assets in nor in Eastern North Carolina. You know, you mentioned you've got a contract drayage firm, which prevents you from dealing with the spot market. But yeah. how do you anticipate investments like, and I'll go specifically, like the CSX connector in Rocky Mount or uh, improved highways in Eastern North Carolina? How much does this factor into your supply chain planning? Yeah, so for us, um, I would say that a lot of our supply chain planning is just basic, you know, I mean, we've got these very costly, uh, hard assets that are very expensive to operate, obviously, and have been around for decades and decades, right? So a paper mill is a fixed asset, which is located in a very specific place. And so for me, um, you know, my ability to pivot and use certain um, supply chain resources really depends on the geographic location of my manufacturing facilities and sites. Okay. So if you talk about, um, you know, like Northeastern uh, or Eastern uh, North Carolina, I mean, I think that uh, what I, what I look at is, you know, we've got great connectivity to obviously the, the port of Virginia, as we mentioned. Um, we, we also have connectivity to the port of Wilmington. 
um, we have in the past and are looking to in the future in 2021 to potentially uh, utilize some bulk shipping out of the Port of Wilmington to our overseas markets as well. Uh, bulk shipping gives us the advantage of maybe cutting out some of the container loading, uh, which is really time consuming and, and, and re requires a lot of heavy lifting, obviously, and a lot of, and a lot of, uh, a lot of bodies. So we can basically um, get, or like you said, ship out a larger amount of tons with less effort when we use a bulk shipping methodology. Uh, so the Port of Wilmington gives us that uh, 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 opportunity as well. Norfolk, uh, I'm not sure if they do bulk shipping. I'm sure Aaron could could speak to that. But Norfolk for us is just a, a very close container partner that can get us anywhere in the world and uh, has, you know, just a premier service level and fantastic facilities. So, you know, I would say that, like you mentioned, there's the contract trucking aspects of truck, truck wise, we're covered. You know, as far as the ports are were covered, the steamship lines uh, provide a very good coverage throughout eastern uh, North Carolina. Um, so, I mean, for the most part, I mean, what I what I will say is we do uh, ha have a pretty complex rail network. So maybe not from our Plymouth facility because Plymouth is so uh, skewed towards exports, but throughout our North America uh, footprint, I mean, we do u utilize rail. Uh, in between our facilities, as well as delivering products straight to our customers. So. Thanks for more details. Sorry to interrupt. I know you're yeah. probably going to talk a little bit more no about worries. that as you get into your supply chain. But yeah, so I think I'm burning through my time here. So just stop me, please, because I know uh, I can go on for a while. <laughs> um, so I, I think you know when I looked at the description of the webinar, disruption was right smack in the middle of this whole thing. And I just wanted to maybe talk a little bit about a couple of things that have disrupted our supply chain in different ways. Uh, so you mentioned technology in your write-up. Um, I'm going to hit technology very quickly, but just call out uh, that, you know, the steamship lines who are really huge partners of ours and help us, you know, uh, carry our containers to overseas markets. Um, have over the past couple of years experienced some pretty significant cyber attacks. And uh, over the past couple of months, you know, we did have CMA CGM, the French uh, shipping firm, who experienced a pretty severe cyber attack that took them out for probably a week and a half, almost two weeks. Um, you know, that in, in and of itself definitely disrupted our business. I mean, they're one of the they, we probably move about 12 to 15 percent of our volume with that carrier, so it really put us in a little bit of a, of a, of a predicament. Uh, so technology and these cyber attacks, which are becoming more and more common, are, are definitely you know areas that we have to keep our eyes on. You know, as far as COVID is concerned, I think we kind of touched base on that quite a bit. The the sales demand reduction for us was a was a huge hit. Um, you know, it, it, it affected our ability to ship to our European uh, customers over the Port of Wilmington. So we do know that the Port of Wilmington, you know, took a bit of a hit with uh, Domtar in terms of, you know, a lot of canceled orders from our customers. And so we couldn't really ship to them. Um, you know, and then, of course, uh, our core domestic paper business took a hit, um, you know, and, and um, you know, essentially... You know we're coming back from that at this point, but but nevertheless, um, you know we we really did uh, experience some, some some major issues, and uh, I would say that to piggyback on on what the previous speaker discussed, which is really interesting to me, is that you know he talked about the several or the multiple phases of the disruption. I think it's interesting that 2020, from my perspective, uh, from global shipping perspective, went from uh, a year where you had the full China shutdown, where people that have been in this business for a long time almost felt like, wow, are, you know, is there ever going to be, uh, you know, are, are, are products ever going to flow back in from China? You know, it, it, it just, uh, like, you got hit in the face with this. And uh, it was such a severe, severe shutdown that the steamship lines didn't know what to do. I mean, there was literally no pr uh, manufacturing coming out of China. Uh, the steamship lines basically reduced their uh, capacity and did what they called blank sailings or canceled sailings. So since nothing was coming in, in, in inbound from Asia, they shut things down and really 
probably reduced uh, their sailings by about 40%. That put us in a very difficult situation because our export product was still at pretty good demand for wood pulp, but we couldn't get space because the vessels were not there from the lack of, of, of import cargo flowing. So you went from that complete shutdown where you even had containers that were displaced. So if you think about the global supply chain, right, everybody expects certain things to happen at certain times of the year, and containers are going to flow in a certain way. Uh, and that was thrown completely out of uh, kilter as well. So containers were completely displaced uh, as well. Um, and then you went from that extreme to another extreme, which is the biggest disruptor for us today, which is that now all of a sudden you have an influx or a surge of imports that are coming in from Asia that are congesting a lot of the North American ports. I mean, the surge is more than just what is usually called a peak season. It's a peak season plus, and it's for an even extended, more extended period of time. So what's really happening with this import surge is that it's making steamship lines dis make decisions that they normally wouldn't make. So demand is very high for imports. Rates are very high on freight coming inbound. We as exporters don't pay very high rates. Uh, what we do is we help the steamship lines to reposition equipment back to Asia so that they can import goods again. But what's happening is that the steamship lines are deciding to kind of back off on the exports, reposition containers empty, going to Asia, taking away, you know, assets from exporters like dump tar and, and some of the agricultural um, uh, manufacturers or growers. And uh, it's putting us in, uh, in a very, very difficult position because, uh, you know, I can't blame them. I mean, they, uh, they're, they're going where the revenue is. The revenue is very high on imports, and they're trying to get their assets back there so they can handle more of those. But it's putting us in a, in a very, very difficult situation. Uh, that's probably the biggest disruptor that we're experiencing today by far. And just about everything that we are looking at as a challenge as an exporter is dependent on what happens with uh, the import flows coming in from, from overseas to, to, the, to North America. Um, Thomas, not to wrap up, I think it's interesting to think about the dynamics of equipment. You know, that's another big factor, getting things moving. So something we'll definitely be watching. And the agricultural tie-in is really relevant to Eastern North Carolina as well for our ag exports. Um, we are going to make a quick transition. I'm going to turn this over to Aaron Lett from the Port of Virginia, who is going to share some information on uh, Norfolk and the surroundings in Hampton Roads. Aaron, um, you want to pull up your camera and mic and you're good to go. All right. Thanks, Dana. Uh, first off, I want to give a quick shout out to Van and Trey. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. And um, also a shout out to um, our friends at uh, Dom Tar and Heister Yale, uh, Andy and Thomas for awesome presentations and, and kind words to us at the Port. Um, I don't have a lot of time, so I want to go through quickly um, an overview of the Port of Virginia and our terminals. So as you can see in the picture, we have six total terminals within the state of Virginia and four that you're seeing right now um, in that main harbor photo uh, with one future um, marine terminal in the works. So I'll highlight two terminals that I believe have uh, the most um, New, new, new information about, which is Norfolk International Terminals. We underwent a huge expansion of that terminal, uh, doubled the capacity of 1.2 million containers over the past three years. Uh, that was a $450 million project. So huge project. Um, as well, at the same time, we were working on Virginia International Gateway, um, expanding that terminal as well to 1.2 million annual containers. Um, and both VIG and NIT right now are semi-automated terminals. So two awesome projects. We're glad that they are now finished with that allows us more capacity um, and being able to house more containers on our terminal. Um, and the future Craney Island Marine Terminal I'll talk about just briefly. Um, that's a project that is on the horizon, um, something that we have our eye on, but basically that's a dredge disposal site that when we dredge the harbor, uh, what's going on right now, we're dredging to 55 feet, uh, which will be the deepest on the East Coast. But while we're dredging, we're disposing the dredge material on that site. And that is 
practically building out our next marine terminal. And it will be the biggest, one of the biggest marine terminals uh, in the nation, but it will be able to house anything that New York, New Jersey has within all their terminals within that one facility. So we're talking big volume. Yeah, it's going to be quite a ways out. I'm saying 10 plus years, but uh, definitely something on the horizon when you're speaking to customers um, that know that the Port of Virginia is growing today and growing in the future. And we'll flip to the next slide. Now, I want to talk about how we are doing in terms of stats and how the Port of Virginia is doing uh, during coronavirus. And that's the main topic of today. Uh, if you're comparing like the chart, January to October 2020 to January to October 2019, we are down. We're down about 212,000 containers. Uh, and Thomas spoke about this earlier, and it is because of the blank sailings, mostly. Um, blank sailings is a cancel of, of a vessel shipment. Uh, I, I compare it to uh, a flight getting canceled at the airport. Uh, you're not able to go in, in that location. So in average, we had about 95 blank sailings since about March, maybe the beginning of March to around um, October, about 95 uh, blank sailings. And that equates to around 200,000 containers, which is about a month's, month's worth of uh, volume for us at the port. So if you really think about that and look at the numbers, 212,000, that kind of makes up the difference there. Um, I'm not saying it's solely because of that, but it, a big chunk is because of the, those blank sailings. Um, and hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping that you know, with the second wave overseas and in China, I'm hoping that we don't have any more. Uh, we're keeping a close eye on it just to make sure. But on a positive note, we've had five months of month over month growth within the port. We're making record breaking volume since uh, August or really since June, sorry, um, at the port. So we just got our October numbers and we are doing very well um, over last year's October numbers. So. Uh, very good positive news on that front. Yet again, it all depends on if we're going to go backwards in this coronavirus uh, back into shutdown in China and overseas and even in the U.S., that, that might start to trickle the other way. But as of right now, we're, we're doing very, very well. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So this is going to take up the majority of my time, but what I want to do is highlight some of the industries and commodities that are faring pretty well during the coronavirus and then some industries and, and commodities that aren't doing so well during the coronavirus. And then we'll also talk um, about the tariff issue as well. Uh, first of all, I think this will come to no surprise is the PPE manufacturing, um, like the masks, the hand sanitizers, the, the gloves, and you can even dive into um, the ventilators. Uh, we were importing a lot of that early on in the year, uh, around the end of the first quarter or second quarter, we were importing a lot through the port. Um, that ended up shifting towards the end of Q3. Uh, we started to export some because we have more manufacturing within the states. Uh, that's had a lot of um, impact on our volumes over the past couple months, um, as well as hygiene products like your toilet paper and your paper towels. And, and Thomas spoke about the, the, flop, the pulp that they do um, at their Plymouth facility. And that, the volume there is, is huge through the Port of Virginia. Uh, we've also seen some uptick in manufacturing in the paper towels and the toilet paper, like select product holdings uh, that announced in Henderson County, North Carolina. We worked with that company to, to locate there and, and Domtar, they're moving a lot of toilet paper and paper products. And we hope that to see that continue to grow to, to man, manage and, and match the supply. Um, pharmaceutical companies are doing extremely well through the Port of Virginia. They're moving a lot of volume. Again, they were moving a lot into the country, uh, Q1, Q2, and then we started to export. And a lot of those companies are in the biopharma crescent within Northeastern North Carolina that, that we've spoke to and are doing fairly well 
um, and business is booming. Um, home improvement companies like Home Depot, Lowe's, the volumes are record breaking volumes through the port of Virginia. We haven't seen anything like it. Um, and we also seen furniture companies do well as well, like BSH Home Appliances. Um, you have your Lowe's and Home Depot. A lot of people are staying at home and looking at projects around their house and painting their walls. I know I just got done painting my house. So um, people are buying. Uh, also going into Michaels and Hobby Lobby. Those are two companies that are doing phenomenal through the Port of Virginia. Uh, volumes are skyrocketing because people are wanting to find things to do around the home, arts and crafts, paint. Uh, the kids are home from school, um, you know, finding other things to do inside rather than outside. Uh, so that industry is doing very well. We saw some backlogged um, shipments from Home Depot and Lowe's just because of what uh, Thomas spoke about, uh, about the, the manufacturing centers in China were shut down earlier on um, this year. So a lot of backlog. I think we're still backlogged on a lot of people ordering things and, and it's taking longer to get their products in. Uh, but we're starting to see that churn and we're starting to see more and more and more cargo coming in, uh, which is very impressive. Um, but I think that also ties into a trend that we see at the port, and that's a, sh a switch from just in time logistics to keeping more product in their warehousing here in the States, as well as maybe finding more warehousing opportunities in the States to, to be able to house all that, all that product in. Um, so we're seeing a little bit of switch from you know, just getting it in on time uh, to, to stockpiling almost uh, certain products just to keep up with the demand. Um, and lastly, e-commerce is doing incredibly well. Uh, as you know, Amazon, Walmart, Target's volumes are already pretty high. Uh, but we've seen just a massive, massive uptick in, in those, those three, and there's, there's more companies like that, um, like Blue Apron, which does um, already prepared food that you, well, food, different products of food that you can cook, and it's all in one basket, and you can cook it uh, later on uh, for lunch or dinner. Uh, we see those companies doing extremely well as well uh, through the port. Um, we see a switch from more brick and mortar companies uh, to more e-commerce business. And I think that's, that's universal, um, that trend with the coronavirus, um, seeing more people order online rather than go into the stores. So it's, it'd be interesting to see how that plays into, uh, into effect over the next couple of years on if we'll see more, um, just more focus on e-commerce than, than actually going into the, the stores and buying things. Uh, interesting thing I saw last night was that Amazon um, is starting a pharma pharmacy online. So that just tells you, you know, kind of the direction that we're going um, in the world that, that you can actually get your, your, your drugs online rather than having to go into the pharmacy. So very, very unique things are happening and um, some of it's exciting, but some of it, you know, is worrisome. Like uh, some of the other industries that are doing not so well are the, the food companies that are supplying uh, restaurants and hotels. Uh, there's several companies that, that we work with that are importing in products from overseas, like seafood or um, any type of imported uh, specialty products. The restaurants are closing or the restaurants are closed and the hotels are, are mostly closed. So and parties are pretty much shut down in mass quantities. So it's they don't have anywhere to, to use those products. So we see a, a downward spiral uh, for those sorts of commodities and uh, products uh, and companies like Fortessa uh, that manufactures um, plates and cups for restaurants and hotels. Um, they're, they're doing pretty poorly because yet again, nothing is open. Um, so we see that, that trend. Uh, another trend, which is interesting is the automobile industry. Um, we saw in the beginning of the year, um, 
it's a negative impact for the automobile industry. And that's because the, the Chinese manufacturing centers were closed, of course, in the beginning of the year in Q1, Q2. And uh, they were producing the automobile parts as well as Italy and some other countries. Uh, so we saw a negative turn and then people started wanting to buy cars and uh, RVs van for you, um, RVs and tractor trailers. And there was such an uptick and it almost backlogged like Home Depot and Lowe's to where people, the demand was there, but you, know, you needed to catch up with that demand. So now we're starting to see more and more and more of that product coming into the port. Um, so it's unique to see kind of the waves on, on how these things are happening. And, and it's, and really you, you don't know where, it's quite interesting when you're thinking about the, the ag products and, and some of the other automobile industry products and some other commodities that you don't know where the tariffs end and the coronavirus starts. And that's, that's kind of a unique trend for us. We're trying to figure out, you know, was it tied to the tariffs or was it tied to the coronavirus? And, and on the tariffs, it was incredibly unique because back in, I believe it was early 2018, you started to really think about, all right, well, how, how is it going to be in the U.S. with all the tariff situation? How are the ports going to handle it? Um, we saw a rush to get cargo in before the end of the year. I think, I believe it was 2018, December 2018 into 2019, um, rushing to, to beat that tariff policy going into effect. And then it kept on getting knocked back by three years, three months, three months, three months. And we saw more rush, more rush, more rush. So our volumes were going up. And then I think by the mid 2019, I think some policies came into effect, which totally, um, I wouldn't say destroyed the agricultural community, but it, it, it definitely had an impact on them. Um, and so we saw a negative impact on ag products, logs and lumber, a grain, um, all those commodities were, were negatively, negatively impacted uh, due to tariffs. And then you saw some light, January, 2020, where, uh, especially to the agricultural community and uh, the logs and lumber community, uh, January 2020 of this year, uh, China was China and U.S. went through phase one of the tariff or, or trade war agreement or trade agreement, and um, they were supposed to purchase around 75 billion dollars worth of manufactured goods, which included the hardwood lumber. Um, and so we really saw. Uh, I think everybody was relieved with that information, as well as in in February, they. We uh, the China raised the ban off of poultry, um, so that was early February, and then you had the the, the seventy five billion dollars worth of, of hardwoods back in January, and then beginning of March, coronavirus hit. So we saw some waves in tariffs as well. We had some ups and downs. I so it's kind of hard to compare what the effect is for some of these ag products and and uh, automobile parts and different commodities to see whether it's a tariff issue or a coronavirus issue. But um, very, very interesting to look at. And uh, Dana, I see you might have a question. I, I'm on my last slide, but happy to answer any questions. No, I like, I'm, I'm suffering a little bit through this very familiar description of lifestyle in, during COVID and yeah. realizing the part we play there. Um, you know, one of the things you brought up earlier is as you start to see these surges, um, the warehousing and distribution networks become a major uh, bottleneck and a challenge for a lot of supply chains. So we're seeing significant investment on square footage and warehouse. You know, your neighbors down here at the port of North Carolina are seeing growth in, in cold storage. Absolutely. Throughout the, academic, throughout the um, commercial real estate space, we're seeing, you know, warehouse prices going, going up. How do you see that continue to impact your operation around the port? Yeah, so for my folks that, that know a lot about Virginia real estate or ha at least Hampton Roads real estate, uh, we have barely zero space here around Hampton Roads, around our port terminals that, that are, is available for um, port uh, development um, and industrial development. So it's interesting to see how that will come into to fact, because like I said, the, the move from just in time 
logistics to more um, you know, needing more space to house some of the, those products. And we're going to need to see more development around here. And, that, yeah. and so that, Dana, that brings up a good point. And, and a good opportunity for North Carolina, exactly. for Eastern North Carolina. Exactly. And I was getting ready to go there. Elizabeth City, uh, Edenton, and we go down in those areas that are so close uh, to the border and so close to the Port of Virginia. I mean, within 30 minutes uh, in Camden County. So we need some development. We, we're going we're gonna to see that trend uh, because it's, I think the most available space that we have in Virginia that is close to our terminals is, is right outside of Suffolk. So you're really talking about distance from the port. It's really the same. So there is a need for it, Dana, um, and it's going to continue to grow. And we've seen the ask, because I'm in economic development, we've seen the ask for more available space within this past year. It's, it's superseded uh, last year's ask. So we know, the, we know the need is out there. Uh, we just need to make sure that it does come to fruition, that we can you know, retain some of these projects that we're getting. Well, that in addition, to hopefully we stop riding the waves of pandemic and tariffs. And I like that you called it the trade war agreement. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, was, that was an very error. Freudian, but yeah. so. um, let's, how do we get in touch with you, Aaron? Um, well, let, let's do that. And then we're going to move on. So if you'll jump to your next slide. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, my email's up there, my cell phone office. So please feel free to give me a call. I'm always available. I'm happy to talk and answer any questions you may have um, regarding the port or economic development or even North Carolina. And we know you're a, you're an Eastern North Carolina barbecue fan too, despite where you live. You're coming down for a good barbecue, so love it, love awesome. it. I always stop at Parker's Gardeners and and um, Smithfield Barbecue. Those are all my favorite. All right. Um, so up next, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Scott Abney uh, from East Carolina University. And if you'll jump to the next slide here, and Dr. Abney, if you will jump on here, and yes. You're ready to go. I am. All right. Um, first off, thank you all for having me today, as well as thank my colleagues for uh, the presentations prior. So what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit from a different perspective, uh, to some extent, as being a professor at ECU with what I'm seeing within businesses and some of the things that we're doing here. Um, the first thing that come up is what is the new normal? And I think that's something that we ask ourselves daily as far as, okay, what exactly is the new normal, when's it gonna begin, um, and going from there. And then the one thing that it's kind of stuck with me throughout this whole ordeal is every fall, I actually teach an introduction to distribution logistics class. And it seems like right around September 11th is when I get to the time frame of teaching security risk in supply chain. And as well as I like to try to think of myself as a younger guy, uh, every year I start realizing more and more that uh, a lot of students in there, whether I have, or, you know, we're not even alive during 9-11. And so the way I try to tell them is um, America before 9-11, America after 9-11 was two different things. And I feel like that is actually something that we're seeing right now. Um, how life was pre-COVID, how life's going to be after COVID. Because right now we're all kind of in the same boat. Um, this, new, this past week, news came out regarding uh, potential for vaccines. So hopefully, you know, that kind of speeds up the process. At the same time, we're all kind of just a wait and see approach. So another thing with what is the new normal is exactly with work, uh, work conditions. You know, Andy mentioned earlier some things, and then that's, that's some of the stuff that, you know, I like to touch on is exactly um, as of right now, I'm pretty sure everyone for the most part is actually working from home as needed as they can. So you're trying to see, balance that out. And I've actually read some studies where uh, companies are trying to gauge exactly um, employment, employee involvement, morale, as far as working from home. Plus the fact is there's a chance of re a reduction in cost. You don't have to have office space. You can actually have someone working from anywhere in the world, um, things of that nature. Other stuff that we're talking about with the new normal is, is exactly with um, conditions at, at uh, workplaces, such as the fact of, you know, you go to a grocery store and you see the new sneeze guard um, in front of the in front of the registers, things of that nature, making sure that you're six feet apart. So right now we're trying to figure out exactly what the new normal is going to be going forward with businesses. At the same time, uh, a couple other presentations have pointed this out, the reevaluation of supply chains. 
Uh, right now, a lot of people are trying to do a critical analysis, root cause analysis, because everyone has a good plan until everything, until something like this happens that, you know, it's a once in a 100 year event. It happens and you thought you had everything shored up in your supply chain. And then you're starting to see where bottleneck issues are happening, where supply chain issues are happening, supplier issues are happening, et cetera. And actually Aaron brought a point that I was gonna talk about with just in time. Um, I've talked to a couple of friends in industry and they run into exact same problems that Aaron just brought up. The fact that uh, one, one friend in particular, his company just switched to just in time um, right before all this happened late last year, early this year, because they were hoping to have reduction of costs, have things that they needed. And then once COVID happened, all of a sudden they have a, their supply is still there. Their supply has actually increased, but uh, I mean, their demands actually increased, but the fact is they have no supply. So I think that is something that you're gonna see a lot of businesses do as far as reevaluate, okay, is just in time actually working for us? Because I think a lot of businesses are gonna be weary of, okay, is there a chance that something like this could happen again? How long is this gonna be, uh, the COVID in, in particular is gonna be riding out? So I think that's something to, to take, kind, of, kind of take note of. And the other big thing is reevaluate supplier base. I put local versus global, but same time, this could be local as far as one state to the next state, because right now we're in a time frame where um, it's not just your basic business as usual, where you know what's pretty much happening in North Carolina is the same thing that's happening in California, et cetera. Each state has its own individual challenges that are going right now uh, due to COVID. So the one thing you're gonna to have to look at is the fact of, okay, well, am I gonna actually stay and use my same supply chain partners? Am I gonna look at maybe expanding my supply chain base, having um, other partners in other regions? Or is it one of those things, again, with nearshoring? That's something that's really, really gonna be coming up. And then we've talked about it. Actually, Aaron brought up some good points with the transportation issues, and so did uh, Andy, with the fact of, you know, just some people, actually, I didn't know this until several years ago when it comes to, uh, to domestic flights. One of those big things with those is the fact that they don't just have your passenger bags. They also have such things as uh, supplies needed for businesses. And when COVID first happened, 90% of your flights are grounded. So again, that just created another bottleneck issue with, with supplies going on. And um, ports, though right now we're having, you know, where, where, our, where our location is, we're between both the uh, Port of Wilmington and uh, Port of Virginia. So Aaron had touched upon that, um, but that's just another thing that's, that's going on with transportation issues with just not only with freight everywhere, especially with ports. So um, go to the next slide, please. So one thing I wanted to put up on, on here is a North Carolina response. And from that, uh, one thing for me, my background, actually I was originally background in political science before I went to supply chain. And so I think one thing that's really important right now, again, is because each state has its own challenges each, on how they're responding to COVID. Um, I wanted to go exactly to see what North Carolina response was and see what they were doing as far as helping with manufacturing with um, supply chain issues. And I have to say, North Carolina has done a pretty, pretty good job. And I put this on here in case you weren't familiar with it. I think it's something that's really, really nice to put out there. It's North Carolina Department of Commerce. And what they have on there is they actually have a website dedicated with solutions that are going on in COVID. And from that, they talk about like local government orders, because again, you know, we're seeing that a time frame where it's changing week to week, day to day. And um, so it's, it's really good to have that. They also have other stuff that can be on there that's, uh, that's beneficial to industry, people in industry, such as um, issues related to taxes, issues related to labor and with COVID. And then another thing they have is actually, that was really, really good was with supply chain. And from that, they actually had it where you could find a local uh, North Carolina supplier. I saw someone mention this in the comments early on, and it's manufacturednc.com. And what that actually does, in case you're not familiar with it, is it's free. Any company can sign up to it. You pretty much tell exactly what it is you manufacture. And other, um, other companies within the state can go and try to find a supplier, a local supplier, to help meet their, meet their needs. So for me, I think that's something that's going to be very beneficial, especially in the North Carolina area. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, but I think this is something that's really great for the fact that when people are going to start reevaluating their supply chains, being able to um, find, have something like this 
to be able to help them give a footing. Okay, well, you know, where are we were doing our business at um, in Asia, in Europe, you know, even in a different state, it wasn't necessarily working during something like this. Hey, I actually found someone who's closer to me, can offer a competitive price, um, probably have a little bit better, might have a little bit better opportunity with that. So I think that's something that's really, really nice to pass along. Um, another thing before I get to the last, the, to the, the next part, the next uh, bullet point is technologies are really big also as far as expanding with right now with the COVID. Uh, two things in particular I wanna talk about. One is with drone delivery. I actually read where uh, a couple of companies around here are using drones to deliver medical products. So that's something that's gonna be really interesting, at least to me, to see how that's gonna play out with, uh, especially you know, with vaccines or with other uh, health PPP issues, as far as being able to deliver using drones. And another thing right now that's actually to take note is with blockchain. For those who are not familiar with blockchain, I'll give you a really, really quick uh, how it was explained to me that actually made really good sense. A lot of times when people hear blockchain, the first thing they think about is, okay, is Bitcoin cryptocurrency because that's what's usually generally associated with it. Um, a way to think about blockchain, if you've never heard about it before, in a different sense is think about it. Your phone has uh, apps on it. Think of the apps such as things as what like cryptocurrency would be such as Bitcoin. The operating system, you know, whether it's Android or iPhone, that would be what blockchain is. It's actually the operating system. There's a lot of different things you can do with it. And so, you know, one of the biggest issues right now with uh, COVID, what's been going on, is the fact of traceability issues. And some of the things that you can read about with blockchain is that actually helps with traceability. Um, it, instead of having one person has all of what's going on within, um, their, within maybe a certain segment of a supply chain, it's actually based on a distributed ledger. So all partners have access to what's going on at any given time. And so right now, especially again, since everything's been going on with COVID and people want to know, okay, what's going on? Do I have a delay here, a delay there? Um, where's it stuck at? There's opportunity and with expansion of blockchain into supply chains. Um, just read where the Air Force is looking to incorporate blockchain as far as helping with their procurement. Um, Walmart last year actually incorporated blockchain into food traceability. So with something like this going on, there is a, uh, to me, it seems like it'd be, there's a lot of interest in other companies trying to figure out, okay, well, is this something we can use to help later on with security issues as well? Uh, finally, my last bullet point on this. When, uh, another thing I saw was North Carolina Emergency Management. It's a because one of the biggest things that's going on with COVID is the fact making sure everyone can eat as needed. So they actually have a food supply chain working group. And what this is supposed to do is address food supply chain issues. Uh, on, I, this is something I didn't know until I moved down here several years ago, that North Carolina is one of the largest producers of poultry and pork. pork. And so what happens on within this working group is they kind of focus on making sure using local farmers and, and everything to try to figure out ways to get this to the end users, whether the end users are health healthcare facilities, schools, restaurants, or grocery stores. And they actually brought up the fact, and I just read an article uh, earlier too, where food banks may be in dire need of food right now. Of course, one of the biggest things is, unfortunately, because of COVID, there, is a, there has been um, employment issues. A lot of people are in employment, not knowing exactly where they're gonna get the next meal at. Um, and the way this has kind of impacted to me on a academic standpoint is, Last year, what we did at the university, and this is my background, is the university, ECU, actually has a, uh, a food pantry program on campus called the Purple Pantry. And what we did was our department, IDAS, was we associated ourselves with the Purple Pantry. And because they had just a small storage area, we had a lab that was open. And we're like, you know what? This could be really good, create synergy for us. And we created a fully functional distribution center. Um, for us, the big thing was, one, um, we a lot of us didn't know until we started working with Pearl Pantry. A third of college students at some point uh, will not know where their next meal is. So to be able to kind of give more exposure to that, so to help students out. At the same time, with creating a, distrib a fully functional distribution center, um, you know, one of my, my roles as an educator is to help my students prepare for their next step after graduation in industry. And so being able to create a distribution center for students to use a fully functional distribution center where we have incoming uh, logistics going on, where we actually use barcodes, scanners, 
have an inventory system, everything of that nature. And again, for a good cause. So that's really, really big for us. Um, so that's, that's something that we actually had created. And then because we actually started uh, using it for the first time this January until COVID hit. And so we only got about eight weeks with our students on there. And so for us, our big hope for this is to be able to uh, adjust as needed to help prepare our students for life after uh, ECU. So that's just a couple of cool points I have. Dana? Dr. Abney, this is great because what it does is it ties in, you know, again, the feeling we're all going through of, of what's changed, um, but it yeah. brings it back to to the local resources we have. And, you know, you talk about manufactured NC and we'll hear a little bit more about that later. Um, but there are great resources in North Carolina and you've got, you know, workforce development right there in the, in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's great points to bring into the conversation and wanted to thank you for being with us. We're gonna to transition to uh, question and answers real quick, but before we do that, um, I would like to introduce a former colleague of mine and uh, uh, Eastern North Carolina staple, Anna Magnum from uh, NC State's Industrial, Supl Industrial uh, Expansion Solutions. And um, IES over at NC State does great things for manufacturers in North Carolina. And Anna's gonna tell us a little bit more about that. Anna, if you want to jump on here. Excellent. Thank you, Dana. And uh, I'll just say we miss you greatly over at NC State. And I just also want to say thank you to our peers over at ECU, uh, because uh, what I want to start with in sharing some of those resources with those of you who are on the call today is to share first and foremost, we are a network that works together to provide you with services and support. Uh, whether it be in supply chain or whether it be in other areas where manufacturers need help, resources, um, and other areas to connect with each other in North Carolina within the manufacturing market. So we represent U.S. commerce on behalf of existing industry for manufacturing in the state. And what you see in front of you here is a graphic that represents all of the major nine partners that work together on behalf of U.S. Commerce. So you can see here that NC State and ECU, as well as some other public universities and some familiar names and probably unfamiliar names to many of you who are on today's call, are all a part of this partnership called NCMEP. If you'll go to the next slide for me, I want to briefly touch on the one tool that's already been mentioned, and that's the Manufactured in North Carolina database, uh, and, and then kind of give you a, a broader vision of what that looks like and some tools that we have uh, that are accessible at no cost for any existing manufacturer uh, from a domestic or national perspective. So MNC, the state's manufacturing database, is a, a, a really kind of traditional tool that we've had in place here in the state for well over a decade. This was created because so many of us that work in a service function and have relationships on the ground with a lot of the small to medium-sized manufacturers in this state, they didn't realize uh, when they would express frustrations to us on the supply chain that they had. And I mean, at the time, so many didn't have a severe interruption or risk in their supply chain that's been discussed today, say from uh, obviously an activity like COVID, but they would express risks and frustrations and things like uh, poor delivery or poor quality. And we would share with them, well, you know, why are you sourcing this from, let's say Brazil, or why are you sourcing this from Kentucky? I know a manufacturer that's two counties over that can provide this to you. Uh, and they just didn't know who was in their own backyard. And so we created MNC, free to create a profile and free for any manufacturer in the state to go on at any time and identify who else, who can they lean on as a supplier to them in North Carolina. But when COVID hit, our partners at US Commerce created a very similar program that uh, demonstrates connection and really relationship development 
for supply connections in uh, whether it was due to reshoring or just doing to due to severe interruption in supply chain. And so that that program is called supplier scouting. So in North Carolina, if you have a profile on MNC or if you know any of the players that I've demonstrated in the MEP network, if you know any of those partners and you are looking for a new relationship to develop with a new supplier, you can leverage these players to do your homework for you. This is a program that comes at no cost to any manufacturer in our state because we want to connect you to those other manufacturers that are in North Carolina and we want to help you do your homework in identifying other manufacturers that are in the United States that could meet your need in any industrial supply chain. It's a formalized program. There are about 1,300 feet on the ground that work under this program. And I highly encourage you to reach out to any of the players that were mentioned prior um, to, to gain further information if this is of interest to you. This is a practical tool and it helps you with relationship research and relationship development for you to move forward and develop uh, contracts, relationships, and, and really vet who could best meet your need uh, here in the US and, and in our state. If you'll go to the next slide for me. Um, so here you've just got my uh, contact information and then the links uh, to both the website for the manufactured in North Carolina database, as well as the partnership that I described earlier for the North Carolina um, MEP. And I'll just say a special shout out uh, to ECU and, and Scott Abney, um, you know, our, our peers over at ECU have been working uh, with us very closely on sharing their expertise when it comes to supply chain risk, supply chain mitigation, and supply chain strategy development. Um, we're also working with them currently uh, on a, a series of different trainings and webinars to, to help teach and handhold some of the manufacturers that have let's say less experience or less talent in-house like a Domtar or a Heister Yale, those manufacturers that are on a, a smaller scale or those second and third tier suppliers of those larger firms like Domtar and Heister Yale um, to kind of help them gain and craft those areas of expertise so they have more stability. Um, and so ECU and NC State are working together um, under NC MEP to, to help and to coach and, and to handhold there. So if you're interested in that kind of support, you know, we actually have funds from the CARES Act that can help go towards providing you some of the, the support you might need or, or want uh, moving forward to develop your stability and business continuity in our state. Anna, thank you for that. And like, like I said, and you pointed out, there's no better resource for manufacturers in, in North Carolina than the NCMEP and, and industry expansion solutions. So get in touch with Anna. I'm looking at the question box and I'm looking at the clock and it looks like we don't have a lot of questions and we're running short on time. So what I'd like to do is really thank all of our panelists, um, Andy, Thomas, Aaron, and Dr. Abney for joining us today. And I'd like to turn it over to Van to close out with us. If you do have questions or things that we didn't cover today, drop us an email, uh, reach out to Van and NC East Alliance, and we'll make sure that we get you in touch with the right folks. Uh, Van, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Dana. Um, Trey? So we want to thank all of you for joining us. We've got some exciting stuff coming up. We're we're looking at partnering with EDPNC. They're putting together a webinar that'll be early December. You'll hear more about that from us um, in the next few days, hopefully. Got a great economic update. December 18th, the Federal Reserve cannot give an economic forecast until that date because they don't want to affect the stock market at the end of the year. So join us that morning before you go on Christmas break. We're gonna really start rolling up our sleeves in 2021. The first is with the ID7 work session. You know, basically during that work session, we're gonna, um, with DOT, county partners, legislators, RPOs, and other experts, we want to see 
how do we move forward? Where are we? What's the next steps? And we're going to pick a lot of issues like that that we're going to try to move the ball along. So if you want to be a partner, a sponsor, helping us with advocacy in the region, we would love to have, um, have you help us. Uh, contact Trey or I. Trey's going to send out a copy of this webinar to everybody. And he's also got some links to some other supply chain discussions that have been going on and are going on. So with that, we'll thank you for, for joining us and we'll see you in a few weeks with another webinar. Happy Thanksgiving.